Hi, I'm Roberta. Welcome to my kitchen and welcome to Yu Chong Lo. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you for joining us. It's great to be here. Now, Chong is the inspiration behind a month of recipes that we're going to broadly call Asian home cooking. But that really is just such a small fraction of your style of food. Um, how do I begin telling you my style of food? <laughs> well, we start with the fact that you're of Chinese descent, born in Malaysia. Is yeah. that correct? Yes. Yeah. Why did you come to Australia? Uh, I probably came here to study to be an electrical engineer. Okay. Uh, but somehow cooking took me away and um, uh, I was really, I guess it's the first thing that, you know, people start to appreciate your cooking almost immediately without me even knowing. Even though the other time, um, this, this is about cooking in a restaurant, mm -hmm. but the other time I do cook a lot is actually for friends and um, uh, we, which we used to live together in Melbourne. So this was while you were studying, you cooked yes. for your flatmates? This, yeah, cook for my flatmates. And I'm the one who did all the cooking really. And uh, they all do the, did the gambling. <laughs> <laughs> and had you cooked a lot in Malaysia? Did you know how to cook? No, I've, 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 uh, I was taught how to cook an egg, which is by my uh, cousin. Okay. And uh, that is a very funny part of and I really enjoy just cooking that, that egg because here we are, we, we're cooking a really uh, pan frying a, a, an egg in a frying pan with a little bit more oil than normal and you really have to spoon the oil over the egg. Okay, I know that technique. You know yes. that technique? And then you just get a really set uh, and I find it really interesting. So was that the first thing you learned to cook? Well, that's the first thing I learned how to cook. Wow. And, okay. and the second thing I learned how to cook was actually from my mum when she whip out a little bit of egg where she put a bit of egg in the frying pan, put a dollop of uh, fish fast on it and then we have to turn the fish and that's what we call a purse egg where we flip it over. Okay. Well, I guess it looks like a purse. Is that yeah, the idea? Of that, the yeah, feeling? the feeling is inside. In that. So that's the second thing, sort of. Other than that, uh, probably uh, teaching chook from my dad's uh, yeah. farmyard and uh, grilling it for my friends okay. over fire, which we didn't know how long it cooks. In fact, it was raw, and we <laughs> then we thought that it was cooked. You know, it's, it's all trial and error. It's all trial and error, yeah. So you came here to study to be an electrical engineer. Yeah. You worked in a restaurant while you were studying to yeah. make a living like we most of us have. Yeah. And along the way you discovered that cooking was much more fun and much more rewarding. Mm -hmm. Much more rewarding. People yeah. appreciated what you were doing. What, what I was doing. And yeah. that's a bit of a high, isn't it? That's right. And I guess did I take the easy way out? I don't think I did. Oh, given the caliber of your food, <laughs> I don't think there's it's, anything uh, easy. Um, but uh, I was really inspired by working in an uh, environment of other culture. In, in my case, it's Greek. So that was the first real restaurant you worked in? A That's the first as real... A, as a line cook? Um, yeah, I was, I was a... Uh, a grill cook. A grill cook. So yeah. what inspired you about that? Uh, first of all, you know, I've never eaten, you know, half a rum or a full rum, which they call a New York cut, that hang over the plate mm -hmm. and it only cost three dollars fifty. It was the nineteen seventies. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> and I said, Oh, Australia must be so much cow, it's so cheap. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it's very rare for us to eat a slab of meat like that. Right. Know. So it was a very different, different cuisine. Different, yeah. And I was, you know, into the your mus musaka, domades, and your kapama, and your yuvetsi, and you know, your uh, taziki, and all those, all those different names. And in fact, I, I find that um, the first thing I went 
is to go and buy a cookbook, a Greek cookbook. Okay. Because I can, when I first hear those names, I couldn't remember the next day what they are. Of course not. I don't, I don't, you know, so I can't even know how to pronounce it, even though I heard over it so many times. So buying the book really tells me how to pronounce it some way, maybe, you know. And, uh, and the worst thing was nobody in the kitchen except the head chef speaks English. Okay, so that's a real immersion. <laughs> <laughs> the rest speaks Greek, you know, and they're, they're Greek women. And, uh, you just so there were Greek women cooking in the kitchen back that's then. That's right. It was the, the aunts and the wives right. and the yeah. daughters of the and, family. Yeah, and, and neighbours and friends. And, did you find any similarity between Greek food and the food you knew from Malaysia? I think other than the herbs and and uh, there are a lot of similarity, you know, uh, cooking the uh, uetsi which you braise it with a little bit of uh, uh, meat and rice together is almost like the uh, having biryani in uh, Malaysia. Okay. You know, uh, the 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 kebab or uh, is almost like. Having a satay, satay, you know, <laughs> it's uh, so it's no different in grilling things. It's just so I'm just uh, judging, and at the same time, I realize that hey, there's a lot of other things I can learn. Mm -hmm. Not just about cooking; it's about other culture. You know, I can I immerse me into you know the Greek culture, and there's more than that. that in, in Australia, I had Polish friends, I had Italian friends, you know, and... Uh, Were and you in Adelaide by this stage? That's right. So you'd moved from Melbourne to Adelaide? Yeah. Um, I think Melbourne was a bit hopeless for me because I just stayed into the Asian uh, student enclaves which doesn't mix with anybody. Okay. You so know? Adelaide was where uh, you really got uh, into that's right. the multicultural, the multicultural Australian culture. Yeah, and uh, you know I got Italian friends, I got, so I got so much information. I, and um, every time I change a restaurant, I went to a, a French restaurant, which is actually a French steakhouse, and uh, so I went into uh, and bought Elizabeth David's. Um, uh, French cooking and uh, to learn about how do you, how do you deal with an artichoke? Okay. And uh, but the artichoke in a book is fresh, and what we're getting is thin. <laughs> so it's a little <laughs> so bit different. So a little different. And how do you? And what's the bayonet sauce? You know, and all these kind of things. And um, uh, so I had to learn another terminology as well. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, also learning another different style of cooking. But the thing is also you measure is actually the temperament of all this culture in their cooking. And the temperament is so different, you know, whether you are, you know, especially I'm sure that in different parts of Greece, there will be different temperament altogether as well. So, and so is cuisine all around the world or every other region. Um, what the, do you mean by temperament? How do you measure the temperament, temperament is about cooking? It's about the people who and what they grow there, how the temperature, climate is all about, and how their daily life is being, you know, for example, you know, southern Italy is different from northern Italy. So the food reflects the culture. Rich, that's right. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and so it also, that's how you have to uh, be aware when you're, when you're cooking as well. And to me, it's become a big cooking adventure with so many different culture. And I virtually, now I've got a room just full of books on... I can imagine. On, on, you know, everything that I want to find out. And amazing thing is, I discovered that uh, Chinese food is just not Cantonese food. <laughs> <laughs> it's got so many different types of food. I mean, in Malaysia, I only thought, you know, there's only one Cantonese food. So you had to leave Malaysia to discover, to discover more about Chinese food yeah, in Australia. Yeah. And but in Malaysia we have a lot of different food like Nyonya, Mama, you know, uh, Kristang as in the 
Dutch and Portuguese influence. Okay. Um, he had uh, Thai and Indonesian influence. Depending which yeah. part of Malaysia yeah. you're in. And then, and then you have uh, Persian. And that's why coming from Malaysia, learning other people's culture is no different as coming into Australia. You're learning a new set. Because Malaysia is already, already so multicultural. So, multicultural. So, so was Nettie's your first restaurant that was yours? Yes. And when did you open Nettie's? The famous uh, 1975. Wow. Yeah. And was that, I, I feel like Adelaide was the birthplace of some of the greatest Australian food. Because you worked with Philip Searle and Barry Ross, or yes. just with Barry? No, I, I, I worked with Philip and I worked with, Barry was, was my first, uh, partner. In fact, uh, we used to dish up curry together in a, in another restaurant. Oh, really? Yeah, and um, uh, and then we became partner in a in a restaurant. And he worked in the front of house, and I was a cook at the back. And his wife is the dessert chef, and Mary is the general helper at the Mary's kitchen. Mary's your wife. Yeah. Was she your wife at the time, or yes. is that how you met? Uh, well, we were butting into it. That, that <laughs> into I, each other. Yeah. Okay. And Tim Papoy came along later, of course. Uh, he yeah. worked with yeah. you and for you at Nettie's. Yep. Yeah. And uh, Tim came in and uh, he says, I love to come and work in your restaurant, but I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I says, No problem. We can, uh, you know, just as long as you don't mind to handling meat if you have to. He says, I don't mind handling it. It's just that I don't like eating it. And six weeks later, I said, have you tried pheasant? He said, no. You want to try some pheasant? <laughs> he says, and yet... You converted him. I converted him on that day. He did everything. He, he had, uh, and so. Chris Manfield is another great chef that's come out of Adelaide. Was yeah. she part of that time or did she yeah, come She later? was part of that time, a bit later. Uh, uh, but she was working with uh, Philip Searle then. And uh, Philip Searle been from uh, from Sydney, and I didn't know that they're all arts people. Right. You know, they they, they got their Chris Manfield was a school teacher, and Philip so was a, a, a art graduate from Sydney, and and they are all into uh, the arts thing. And I actually didn't know when I was cooking in Nettie's, I do not know anything other than I really like and the field of Nettie's because we had young Australians who are really open to anything. Uh, when the summer is hot, you wear t-shirt and sarong. And we were cooking things that are not fixed. What were you cooking? Tell us about the food of Nettie's. Because I think this is where your food Nettie's really was, began. Nettie's was a mixture of food from uh, the dishes that I have cooked in Australia, I have cooked, um, for example, in the pub, the, we had that version of a steak Diane, okay, I put on a steak Diane. I've cooked in a Greek restaurant, I put a few cup Greek uh, dishes on. Uh, I've cooked in a Spanish restaurant, which is everything come out of a tin, but that's all right, but at least I know the name. So we put, put all those dishes and I cook whatever, my grandmother used to cook and whatever popular dishes, uh, Malaysian dishes. And at that time, Malaysian dishes, I actually learned it from uh, Charmaine Solomon cookbook. Bless Charmaine. <laughs> Absolutely. And that was my first Malaysian cookbook, which I bought in Australia. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, I, I was really keen on learning. I don't care you know, what I'm learning then, just as long as I'm cooking something. And um, and, I, and then later on I bought all the great chefs of France cookbook. I bought uh, the uh, Four Season cookbook from America. You know, I bought, then I started buying all the uh, French uh, educational technical books, mm -hmm. sets of them. Uh, and also buy a lot of uh, Chinese cookbook, which you know, uh, from different regions. From different regions, okay. and and at the same time, from what Cantonese home cook is very different from restaurant food. Yes. Uh, so, big learning. 
And the food you cooked at Nettie's, when you say you took influence from the Greek restaurant, the Spanish restaurant, the, the grill restaurant, did you cook those dishes classically or did you start to fuse then? Is that when your fusion... I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, uh, if I fuse anything with, um, by a mistake or by design, not by design, certainly, it's something like there's a description in the French cookbook and I do not understand as well for example, how do you cook a, a duck? I know the Chinese way of cooking duck. And I actually thought to myself, I said, why can't I cook things better than what it tells me to cook? Because I know uh, from my childhood upbringing, I know that the best way to eat these things is actually this is the way of cooking it. But the flavor is entirely different. So how are you going to, I just have to blend in and mix that flavor to the cooking of an Asian style cooking. So you took the French flavors yep. and you took the to way you knew, knew to, how cook, to cook and that was the beginning yeah, of that's your fusion. Right. Uh, for example, if I want to uh, uh, do a fish dish or a prawn dish, uh, I know the best way how to deal with uh, when I eat this prawn and everybody will accept, will agree to me that hey your prawns is so much different to eat than somebody cooking the same prawns because I know how to cook the prawns the way how it should be eaten or how I deal with a chicken or you know uh, but yes come to fish, I must agree, Greek style fish, I really love, I love it, you know, and more so than the French, I mean the French is good, but the Greeks are really good with their seafood, and uh, and it's so simple, very, very simple, you know. So after Nettie's, you opened the Grange, but in between times you were teaching for a while at Regency? Yes, I was, I was, after the, after Nettie's, I, I was teaching at uh, the Regency Hotel School. Which is one of, uh, in its time, one of the leading hotel schools in Australia, if not yeah. the leading. Okay. And I taught there for seven years. Right. And at that time, when I was at college, I was really building up the idea of the Grange dishes. And uh, And what inspired them? Because they're very different to what you're talking about at Nettie's. Well, first of all, I want to clean up some of the dishes that I have at Nettie's. In right. fact, some of them, from pork hock to, you know, a lot of the dishes uh, I used to cook at Nettie's days, but it, now, I'm, now I'm using those dishes and turning them into like mainstream dishes. Okay. And, and trying to convince people these are mainstream dishes. And first of all, I need to, the staff, which, you know, uh, has very limited knowledge of worldwide knowledge but they have, you know, European uh, skills of, of training from Regency Park College. And um, uh, so I need them, first of all, is to put their head into a different frame of cooking is actually, the essence is fresh and uh, clean flavors. And, and, and freshness is the main thing. And knowing your produce, knowing the season, knowing your, you know, uh, a lot of them just don't know very much about anything. And by now, is this the late 80s or the early 90s? This is the uh, uh, late 80s. Late 80s. So I think we take it for granted now. Every chef talks about their cuisine being produce driven. Yeah. Everyone talks about freshness and seasonality. But not so much back in the 80s. No, Those kids were at, at college yeah. learning French classics. They yeah. weren't really dealing with fresh, fresh seasonal meat. produce, no. were they? So I have to change their mind and, and the Grange that this is what you have to do. So nobody, no, nothing better is actually to first start off is to appreciate some of the good fish we have in South Australia. Yes and actually the emphasize on the freshness of the um, uh, of the ingredients that we, we were using and the thing to do that is actually 
you have to teach your purchasing officer. Right. And to do that, uh, I was really lucky that they gave me free run that I can demand. And in fact, even up to now, I'm, last week, I'm still working with this purchasing officer who changed his job now to the casino. And he says, Cheong's coming. He says, wow, watch out. It's gonna be, everything's going to be different. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, um, I want to buy the freshest seafood and the fishmonger, we also have to train them that when we pay for this, we need them to come really good fresh seafood. I don't pay, I tell them that I don't mind paying you $2 more, but you give me fresh ingredients and you, and you handle it properly. And I feel like this is very Asian. This goes back that's to right. your Asian, Asian heritage. That's right. I mean, you buy fish live in Asia, that's right. right? Yeah. And your food is all about the freshest fruit and vegetables. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you so took that Asian yeah. ethos yeah. and brought it into the Western kitchen. Yeah, it brought it into, into yeah. And, and, and that's how I put out Four Dances of the Sea. I was going to ask. Now, yeah. Four Dances of the Sea, without a doubt, your signature dish for the Grange. Yeah. Tell me about the four dancers. Basically, this is a training dish. Really? Yep. For your, this, for your chefs? For my chefs. Because if they know how to do this dish, they know how to blend flavors, they know about freshness, they know about presentation. You know, basically, it's a really high demand. It's, it's basically, in those days, I push them like a sergeant major and say, this have you got to do it, and you got to precisely do it every day everyone, every plate, and I pushed them and I was very forceful. It's a things. fabulous dish to eat. Uh, and, um, uh, and that's how, the, and then starting, all the other chefs become to take in, you know, and, and, and starting to work with me, and says, you know, starting to watch out uh, for the, the ingredients, and to know the ingredients, I says, we pay lots of money for these ingredients, we have to use every ounce of it, also something that wasn't a concept in the 80s. No. Now it is, yeah. nose to tail, no waste, but not in the 80s. No. And, and well, that's how, that's how I want my chef, you know, that we try to, if it is, if the fish is $50 a kilo, I make sure that I use every bit of it and I don't have to give them like the, the what the, every public is giving their fish, 150 gram per person or 200 gram per person. I say it's 80 gram, okay? They are really good variety fish which they can't get it anywhere else except from, yeah. our, from, from our restaurant. And, and we will give them a lot more other compliments. I make sure that every dish by the end of the meal, and that's how my uh, tasting menu goes, you will have vegetable, fish, meat, every, you would have eaten every almost a full animal, <laughs> not 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 a, a full animal, but the full spectrum of right. Um, you know, greens, fish, and meat. Can we go back to the four dancers for a yeah. minute? Because I feel like there's another part to that story. And tell me if I'm wrong. But I had a feeling that those four dishes also related to the different restaurants you'd worked in and the yeah. influences. Yeah. So, for those of us who didn't eat the four dancers. Can you tell us what each component was? Well, uh, starting from, uh, I call it six o'clock. Yes. Uh, which is uh, Sao Snook. Uh, I learned that when I was teaching at Regency Park College and I had a guest, uh, a guest chef coming into my class to show us how to deal with uh, uh, some, a few Japanese dishes. Right. And her name is Tomono. And, and, um, uh, she, she's the wife of a friend of ours who's a winemaker or from Mount Adam and uh, so she came in and introduced Sao Snook which she says Australian maybe not ready for raw fish yet and uh, so a little bit pickled. So give them pickled and Snook, and, we don't see Snook in well, Sydney but it's a South Australian fish, a long... Uh, it's like a, like a sea spike. Yes. Okay. Pike, pike fish. Pike, yes. Yeah. And um, uh, it's long, it's got white oily fish, 
which you know. Um, so we cure that uh, with a bit of um, stock sugar and vinegar with uh, some uh, corn bu, um, and then uh, we just only about three hours of pickling, and then we slice it up and she uh, served with us with a little bit of rice and nori and it was just lovely for us to eat. So I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to use that uh, as my fresh dish because I also want my chef to handle very fresh fish. And, um, and, and so there's a good start. And of course, you know, avocado is going to come in. Um, and also I learned from a Swiss chef who cooked with me at Regency Park and she, he taught me how to pickle these wonderful cherries that we have, you know, have, uh, in South Australia. Every year after Christmas is the best time to go and buy those cherries. And um, so we pickled cherries too. The first one was snook with avocado, pickled cherries, uh, um, and I even give it a little bit of uh, a wasabi mayonnaise and, and seaweed sauce sort of implant a little bit of Japanese things into the first round so that to give them the idea. Yeah. And then the second one was actually uh, squid ink noodles with a wrap in a Spanish cookbook and we have it in raw squid uh, to eat it uh, which they also they, they also eat a lot of raw seafood and same as the, the Italian as well. Um, and so I make that sort of like a Mediterranean style of, uh, but the noodles has got an Asian dressing. <laughs> <laughs> it's got an Asian dressing of, um, of um, soy sauce, oyster sauce, sesame oil, chili oil, you know, um, balsamic vinegar. Uh, yeah. and I think balsamic vinegar is Asian, chef. It has to be Asian in that one. <laughs> and so here's the fusion. <laughs> that's again. right. And then we have some a few drops of rose wine, uh, oh, Chinese rose wine. Chinese, yes. Yeah. And the rose wine, I added in. This basically recipe concoction is very similar to my mum's noodle, cold noodles dressing. And I add a little bit of that rose wine. It actually opens up. The noodles doesn't let you taste too much. Wouldn't let you know what sauce is actually in it, because the dominant of this little flavor really cleans up everything. You know, it becomes really nice to eat. It's giving you into another dimension, and to have it nice popping salmon eggs Ooh. to go with the raw. Squid. Also and the, the color, the orange. Yeah, the orange. I forgot about the, the white salmon roast. Yes. And the black. So that's sitting at nine o'clock on the plate. Nine o'clock. Six o'clock. Nine o'clock. Yeah, and then on twelve o'clock, it's um, where I learn how to cook Greek style food. Is olive fried octopus. I think that was my favorite. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, I, it's still um, I'm still using those dishes everywhere I go. You know, it's it's just cooking uh, octopus in um, really hot oil with fried olives and then submerge it in, in, uh, in, uh, in into the oil and gently cook it for about 40 minutes, very low. So you cook it at high temperature quickly okay, and, and then, then you poach it at yeah, low temperature. Yeah. And it, it, like the Greeks say, it's a poor man's lobster and that's how it tastes like. I've heard that, yes, because you know? then it becomes a soft, soft lobster. Soft, soft, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I had uh, uh, an Italian style of uh, confit eggplant with just oil and garlic, you know, and salt with the eggplant to it. Um, and then the last dish, which is three o'clock, which I call it a prawn, a prawn sushi, which is nothing more where I come from, is a prawn sambal on a coconut grilled rice they roll up like a sushi okay so, so again a fusion but a very obvious logical ob fusion yes that's right but you know that's that's actually a very typical of where i come from from 
from Malaysia is to having coconut glutinous rice, char grill in banana leaves, and then you have this spicy prawn on top. Yum, you've taken me back a yeah. long way. I haven't so, eaten those for a while. So that almost described to you about the multicultural. Yes. Uh, uh, and all the, as, just imagine the, the young chef have got to remember all the sequence. They are actually, all the, there are 54 elements that needs. That went into that one dish. One dish. And virtually everyone who dined at the Grange ate that dish, yeah. didn't they? And on the plate he has about uh, 24 movement right. to put everything on the plate. Wow. Yeah. So from there, when you closed the Grange about 15 years ago, and we look at now, where you tell me that for the last, well most of the last 10 years at least, yeah. you've been cooking for your family every yeah. day. Yeah. So it's a little bit different to the 54 elements of the four dances, isn't Forget it? Forget about it. <laughs> Throw that out the window. <laughs> so what, what do you cook now? What's home style cooking for the, the Lou family? Um, very simple uh, steamed chicken, steamed fish. Um, cooking a lot of hock and trotters, uh, belly pork. But I cook a lot more children food, which is different. So you cook for your seven grandchildren Yeah, now. and um, I cook all sorts of things from um, pasties, pies, <laughs> sausage rolls. With, that, with any Asian flavors? <laughs> oh, I give them. I got one, I got one um, uh, granddaughter who only eats white rice and soy sauce. That's and the other, thing, the other thing that she likes to eat is what she calls a lamb lollipop, which is a lamb loin ribs really okay you know you gotta yeah and that's how she hang on to that and that's how she likes to eat it so she thinks it's a lollipop yeah. and it means she's eating that's her right. meat that's good yeah so um making a lot of beets types of biscuits for them to you know snacks and when a young you know uh, i make a lot of different biscuits yeah. so chong if we're cooking in a country like Australia or even Malaysia that is so multicultural, how do we fuse flavors without making them confused? What, what are there a couple of rules that you have used because you were dubbed, rightly or wrongly, the father of fusion cuisine? But people who tried to follow in your footsteps often made confusion cuisine. So, how do we fuse successfully? I think you're going to know. Every element that you're cooking, you have to know the, first, the rules before you break the rules. That's right. You got to know the rules before you you break the rules. You, and breaking the rules is it's um, is actually make sure it's for the better. No point. Um, no point breaking the rules for the sake of breaking the rules. And a lot of them are doing that, you know. But you got to make sure that they are complementing each other. And this they was your are. French duck example. Yeah. I know the flavors are yeah. good here, yeah. but I know the technique's better here. Yeah. I'm going to bring yeah. the two together. Yeah. And, and, and there are a lot of uh, elements like that. And, and then the more you cook, the more you find that, hey, actually, the world, are, you know, they are, they are cooking almost similar dishes everywhere in the world. Like the Greek stews yes, that yeah. reminded you of yeah. the Malaysian uh, stews. Or, or, or any, any bread or anything like that. And, and, and I find that there's so much similarity that um, uh, even from the complicated, you know, braising method of the Chinese, and I discovered that in the, uh, uh, the day, the, the uh, 16th century, even in England, they were boiling, you know, their meat and then they also deep frying in their fat. Right. You know, in a similar way to the way that, the Asians that, do. That's right. Day. You know, and then they might braise it again to make it soft. Right. Know, maybe it's, if you catch an animal that is so tough, you've got to cook it a lot of times. So that's so how these it goes. techniques grew out of necessity. Grew up, yeah, it grew out of necessity and it grows up. And I think for a chef, it needs to understand what it is that if you enjoy eating. The pleasure of eating, not just something simple, or not just 
where you want to eat something and it explode in that. And, and I always say that my food in the Grange, whoever eats it, will be once in a lifetime that enjoying it, it will, it, it will be, they will remember them, all the dishes they have eaten for the rest of their life. So we go back to the beginning where you were inspired to cook because it made people happy and yeah. people respected what you were doing. Yeah. So there, were, there are a few rules. I was, when I was opening a restaurant, I don't want to open a restaurant because everybody's mom is doing the same thing. This is what my Asian outlook. I don't want to go to a Chinese restaurant and eat the same thing that my mom cooking. I want to eat in a restaurant that mom don't do it. So that's how the outlook of the restaurant should be. And if we're cooking at home for friends and family, what's the what's the number one tip there? I always choose the best ingredient you can get. I like that. That's what we do. Yeah. And uh, I know that's what you do. So, Chong Lu, thank you so much. Pleasure. Cheers. Cheers. Here's to cooking for loved ones. Yeah, and be inspired. <laughs> <laughs> he likes that. Enjoy.